Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're looking at something, well, pretty radical. Yeah. It's this idea that electromagnetism, you know, one of the basic forces, isn't just fields acting out there in space, right. but might actually be woven right into the fabric, the geometry of space time itself. Yeah, it's a fascinating perspective shift. Think of it as maybe a shortcut, uh, a new way to grasp reality at its core. Really relevant if you're curious about how the universe fundamentally works. Exactly. And it builds on this long history in physics, doesn't it? This move from thinking purely in particles. Like Newton with light particles. Right. Newton's corpuscles yeah. versus Huygens saying, no, it's waves. Mm -hmm. This research sort of continues that journey, mm -hmm. asking if even electromagnetism has this deeper geometric layer. Okay, so let's dig into that. Yeah. The huge question here is, could forces like magnetism, electricity, you know, the stuff powering your phone... Yeah, everyday forces. Could they be explained like gravity? Through space-time curvature, the way Einstein showed us? That's the core question. And the really wild part, based on the material you shared, is that the answer seems to be yes... And maybe even electric charges themselves aren't separate things. That's what's so mind-bending. The idea that charge itself could be part of space-time structure. Wow. And the way they get there is really interesting. It involves looking at the math, describing space-time, the metric tensor. The sort of uh, ruler for space-time distances. Precisely that. But instead of the standard geometry of general relativity, they explore something called Weyl's space. While space. Okay, what's different there? Well, imagine your space-time ruler not only bending, but also having the ability to, like, subtly stretch or shrink locally. Ah, so it's more flexible than just curving. Kind of, yeah. It allows for changes in scale as you move around. Mm -hmm. And this, this seemingly small tweak opens up entirely new possibilities for describing forces. So from this more flexible geometry, they derive a new version of, of Maxwell's equations, the laws of E and M. They do, using something called the principle of least action. Which is basically nature choosing the most uh, efficient path. Exactly. They look for the optimal way this space-time ruler can behave. Mathematically, it leads to a condition they call harmonic metrics. Harmonic metrics, right. And then they connect the space-time ruler directly to the electromagnetic field itself. Yes, using the electromagnetic four potential. It's a clever way to sort of embed electromagnetism into the space-time description from the start. Okay. And when they combine this embedding with the harmonic metric condition, boom, you get a new set of equations for electromagnetism. Not the standard Maxwell's equations. Similar, but more general. They call it the generalized Maxwell's equation, or GME. And crucially, it's nonlinear. Nonlinear, meaning the field can interact with itself. Exactly. In ways the standard linear equations don't account for. This could be important in extreme conditions. Okay, so new laws for E and M from geometry. But what about charge? You know, the electrons and protons that actually feel these forces, how does charge fit in? Ah, that's where wild geometry really becomes key. Sticking to standard Einsteinian geometry makes it hard to sort of naturally incorporate charge without issues. Right. But wild geometry, with its variable scale factor, right. that seems to provide a natural home for it. It's like the stretching and shrinking is related to a, what we perceive as charge. Hasn't this idea of linking geometry and forces been tried before? Weil sounds familiar. Oh, absolutely. Herman Weil himself tried this back in the early 20th century. A true pioneer. But it didn't quite work out then. His initial attempt had some problems, yeah. But the core idea of wild geometry keeps coming back. This research offers a new take on it. So how do they make the connection between this flexible geometry and like an electron feeling a push from a magnetic field? They make a really important assumption that charged particles follow the straightest possible paths, geodesics, but in this wild space time. Okay. The straightest path in this stretchable, bendable space. Exactly. And when they work through the math using their specific way of linking the metric and the E and M potential, something pretty amazing pops out. Which is? The equation describing that straightest path, it turns out to be exactly the Lorentz force law. No way. The actual equation that tells us how charges move in E and M fields. The very same. And what's more, a term naturally appears in the derivation that perfectly corresponds to electric charge density. Wow. So the force and the charge just emerge from the geometry. It seems so. Two sides of the same geometric coin, as you said earlier. Yeah. And they also find this link where the way the electromagnetic field uh, flows is tied to the charge distribution. Like, the field tells space time where the charge is. That's incredibly elegant. But does this complex new picture still connect back to the standard Maxwell's equations that 
you know, work so well for most things. It does. Yeah. If you look at their generalized Maxwell's equation and make some simplifying assumptions or look at a specific contraction of it, okay, it reduces to something very close to the linear Maxwell's equations we all learn. They derive a relationship, mm -hmm. A ibs to su g, linking how the E and M potential changes, that's the EMA part, to the flow of charge and current, the G part. Ah, so the familiar equations are like a special case of this deeper geometric theory. Precisely. And this derivation has some really cool implications. Like the Zitterbewegung thing. Yeah. That charge itself propagates like a wave. Exactly. In the simplified flat space-time limit, their equations lead to a wave equation for charge density itself. Areas who? Meaning charge ripples travel at light speed. That's the implication. This idea of Zitterbewegung, a particle like an electron having this rapid internal light speed jiggle, it just falls out of the geometric picture. That's wild. So it's not just an add-on, it's fundamental here. And deriving the linear equations from this more general non-linear framework is huge. It might give us handles on things the linear theory can't explain, like why does the electron have the mass and charge it does? Right, the fundamental constants. This could be a first step towards actually modeling electromagnetism in those really intense nonlinear regimes where we know the standard equations probably aren't the full story. Now, you also mentioned they looked at this using a totally different mathematical tool, Clifford algebra. Is that right? Yeah, a parallel approach. It seems mathematically simpler, maybe more direct in some ways. Okay, what's the gist of that? Instead of tensors in curved space, they use Clifford algebra objects. They define a kind of space-time derivative operator. Let's call it euro. Like a calculus for space-time. Sort of, yeah. And they represent the E and M potential, A, in this algebra. When they apply this operator, euro, it naturally splits the field into a scalar part, S, and the familiar electric and magnetic fields, F. Okay, so it unpacks the potential. Exactly. And then the simplest form of Maxwell's equations becomes just error A equals zero. That's it. Euro equals A euro. That looks incredibly simple. Deceptively simple. But when you expand it out, you get back Faraday's law, Ampere's law, mm. all the standard stuff. Wow. And crucially, it shows that charges and currents basically emerge from this scalar field S. Mm. Specifically, the current J is related to how S changes J equals zero. And since S itself came from the potential, mm. then the current comes directly from the potential, right? J, euro A, which is consistent with that euro J, result from the other approach. And it suggests charge isn't something separate you add in. It's part of the field structure itself. So both the geometric approach and this Clifford algebra approach point towards charge being intrinsic to the field or geometry. They seem to converge on that, yeah. yeah. Two different languages describing the same underlying idea. And does this Clifford algebra way also point to Zitterbewegung? It does. The equation for that scalar field S turns out to be a wave equation, euro S equals zero. Since S is related to charge, this again implies charge disturbances travel at light speed. Zitterbewegung again. The Zitterbewegung idea seems central. How does it connect to quantum mechanics, like the electron's wave nature? They propose a really neat picture. Think of the electron's light speed Zitterbewegung as having two parts. Oh, okay. There's a rapid circular oscillation, also at the speed of light, happening internally. And then there's the overall drift velocity of the electron that we actually measure. So like a tiny internal spinning top moving along. Kind of. And they suggest this internal circulation is the electron spin. Ah, okay. Makes sense. And the quantum wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength. That arises from how this internal Zitterbegagun oscillation looks to us when the electron is moving. It's like a Doppler effect almost. You mean the internal jiggle frequency gets stretched or compressed from our view? Exactly. The frequency of that internal clock related to its rest mass energy appears different depending on the electron's velocity relative to us. And that apparent change in spatial frequency is the de Broglie wavelength. So, wait, the basic rule of quantum mechanics, that particles have waves, that's not just a postulate here. It's a consequence of the Sitterbebegung structure. That's the argument they make. It's quite profound. All the experiments confirming electron waves are basically validating this underlying light speed structure. That is profound. And things like relativistic mass increase also fit this picture. The faster the electron goes, the more energy is tied up in maintaining that internal light speed circulation against the direction of motion. What about the main equation for relativistic electrons, the Dirac equation? Does that fit too? They mentioned it can also be reformulated using space-time geometry, using techniques involving spinors and Clifford algebra again. Okay. They connect the mathematical structure of the Dirac equation directly to space-time properties. 
And interestingly, they suggest the mass term in the Dirac equation, the MCNA, might arise directly from the space-time metric itself. So potentially explaining mass without needing the Higgs field? It's a potential alternative perspective, yes, coming directly from the geometry. Amazing how interconnected this all seems. But, okay, let's circle back. If this new generalized Maxwell equation is the true theory, why do the standard linear ones work so well most of the time? And why can't they explain things like why electron charge is quantized? Right. The linear equations are incredibly successful, but they treat the elementary charge, E's, as just a number you plug in. They don't explain why charge comes in those discrete packets. Or the value of the fine structure constant E, which is related to E. Exactly. The very existence of these fundamental constants hints that the underlying reality is nonlinear. So where's the boundary? When do we need to use the more complicated generalized Maxwell equation instead of the standard linear ones? Is it just about super strong fields, like the Schwinger limit? Apparently not just field strength. They propose the boundary is actually tied to something else fundamental. Hmm. The quantization of magnetic flux. Magnetic flux quantization? How does that come in? Well, think about an electron orbiting. For its quantum wave function to be consistent, to meet up with itself after one loop, uh -huh. there are constraints on the momentum and the electromagnetic potential. Working through this leads directly to the known result that the magnetic flux enclosed by the orbit must come in integer multiples of Hibiki, Planck's constant over the elementary charge. So that quantum rule pops out too. Yes. And it shows this deep inverse relationship between the elementary charge and the elementary unit of magnetic flux. Back. So they argue that understanding this fundamental quantum value, this quantized flux related to A do, requires the full generalized Maxwell regime. It's tied to space-time curvature effects, not just energy density. So the need for the GME isn't just high energy. It's about understanding these fundamental quantum units themselves. That seems to be the conclusion. The stabilization of the elementary charge value is intrinsically linked to this deeper, nonlinear geometric structure. Okay, let's try to wrap this up. This has been a lot to take in. The core idea is this potentially revolutionary shift, seeing electromagnetism not as just a force, but as geometry. Right, a kind of geometrodynamics echoing Wheeler's ideas. Maxwell's equations become an optimality condition for space-time geometry. The Lorentz force is just particles following straight paths in this geometry. And charge itself, maybe even its wave-like zitter bewigan, emerges naturally from the structure. And you mentioned it might even explain weird quantum stuff like the Aharnov-Bohm effect. They suggest that additional terms arising in the geodesic equation, in the most general case, could account for it, yeah? Where potentials matter even if fields are zero. Which also opens up the wild possibility. Could we actually manipulate local space-time geometry with really strong fields or currents? If they're this deeply linked, it's certainly an intriguing theoretical possibility. It's a definite departure from standard gravity using metric-compatible connections. Towards wild geometry for EM. Right. And the way the electrons wave nature and the Dirac equations seem to fit geometrically offers this whole new way to think about particles and mass, maybe sidestepping the Higgs mechanism. But the big mysteries remain. Why is charge quantized? Why does the fine structure constant have that specific value about 1137? Exactly. Those are still the frontiers. The researchers suggest digging deeper into the solutions of their generalized Maxwell equation is where the answers might lie. And they even hinted that maybe quantum vacuum fluctuations, particles popping in and out of existence, might be linked to tiny fluctuations in space-time geometry itself at the Planck scale. Where do those fluctuations come from? Another deep question. It leaves you wondering if E and M maybe matter too, are just space-time doing complicated things. What does that ultimately mean for reality? And what could we potentially do if we truly understood that connection? It's a profound perspective shift to ponder.